Welcome everyone, we're going to get started. Thank you all of us for, or for all of you for joining us today on this lovely fall morning. My name is Joel Stangler and I am a senior in the College of Liberal Arts studying political science, journalism, and management. Um, and I'm delighted to be here this morning to serve as your MC. And we're so grateful for your hard work on behalf of all of the students and faculty in the college. Uh, before we get started, I want to let everyone know that we are recording this today so that we may share this conversation with a broader audience at a later date. One year ago, Dean John Coleman shared his vision for the College of Liberal Arts during his inaugural Road Ahead Address. This morning, we are excited to share with you the progress we've made since then both envisioning our path forward and implementing final steps. During our time together, I'll share with you an update on CLL, CLA's overall road ahead plan. And I'll also tell you a little bit about my own CLA journey and how the college is helping me prepare for life and a career after graduation. Later, Professor Mark Snyder will talk about his experience helping the college move its research agenda forward and give you a glimpse into his own work on why and how people become actively involved in doing good for others and for our greater society. Finally, CLA alumna and Care 11 reporter Bua Zhang will kick off a conversation with Dean Coleman about his vision for the college and his dreams for liberal arts moving forward. At the end of our program, Dean Coleman will answer questions that were submitted prior to the event, and this will be followed by a reception where you are welcome to continue the conversation over coffee. And to get started, I'm going to quickly bring us all up to speed on our planning efforts from this last year. Last January, Dean Coleman convened five teams made up of faculty, staff, students, and alumni to shape our roadmap goals. The teams were asked to explore current activities and emerging needs in five key areas. And these areas were readiness, research, leadership in grand challenges, diversity, and public engagement. And between January and March, the goals teams met and drafted preliminary recommendations to Dean Coleman on ways the college could best prepare students for meaningful lives after graduation, to ensure faculty have the space and resources needed to launch or continue innovative research, to infuse greater diversity into our academic programs and more deeply engage with our surrounding Twin Cities community. I had the privilege of serving on the readiness team with a few of the people I see in the room around me. And as the University of Minnesota student body president, I spend a lot of time thinking about the undergraduate experience and how it can be improved, including how we can make our graduates ready. And while I was able to reflect on what would be best for my peers, I was also able to reflect on my unique experience and my personal story in the College of Liberal Arts through being involved with the readiness team. And so when I thought about it, I thought about when I first came to the University of Minnesota in 2012. And back then, I was interested in literally everything. I wanted to be pre-med, pre-law, a journalist like Woodward or Bernstein, an expert in criminal justice reform, an award-winning screenplay writer. I wanted to be able to then also teach high school civics like on the side, as if that were a thing, um, and then find some time in the breaks to tour around with my award-winning novel. Like I actually wrote down these things. This is everything I wanted to do, which is just one way of saying, like many College of Liberal Arts students, that I didn't know what exactly I wanted to study or what exactly I wanted to do after I graduated. And so I started my journey taking introductory classes in the majors I felt interested, interested in. And from the start, I felt supported in exploring all my options and most specifically supported by my advisors um, who were wonderful in helping me in, and encouraging me to explore. Um, and so I was able to explore, but I also hone in on my passions. So the liberal arts was uniquely poised to provide me with flexibility, but also guidance in making my college experience and education fit all of my needs. And through, through the College of Liberal Arts, I've had a range of experiences that have prepared me to be both a critical thinker and a holistic global citizen. During my sophomore year, I began to supplement my coursework with co-curricular activities. I was selected to serve as the undergraduate student representative to the Board of Regents, where I got to research topics pertinent to students at the university and compile a series of recommendations for board action. And I used that report as a writing sample that garnered me a research opportunity with a professor in the School of Journalism and Mass Communications. And so not only did these experiences teach me about the necess necessity oh, of effective research and communication, but they also helped me understand the ever-changing environment of identifying questions and learning to seek out new answers. 
This led into my junior year where I had multiple internships that gave me real world understanding of K-12 education and state level politics. My first internship was working in the grants division of Minneapolis Public Schools and my second was interning for a higher education lobbyist during the last 2014-15 legislative session. And these structured experiences enhanced by my faculty mentors, my excellent advising, um, and my support systems provided me the necessary background to be an effective student leader and an agent of real world change, um, change in real world policy decisions. In learning how to be an effective change maker, I was lucky enough to be able to provide testimony for a floor speech on college affordability for Senator Franken, um, and then was later invited to be his guest of honor at President Obama's State of the Union address, which was the top five experiences of my entire life. It was absolutely amazing. And so not only did the college teach me how to connect these experiences, but it also taught me the value of taking initiative and clearly articulating intentions, motives, and purpose. So it's no surprise that when I was talking with the senator and he asked me what did I want to do with the rest of my life, I looked him right in the eye and said, I want your seat in the Senate. <laughs> Taken aback and a little concerned with the gumption of a 20-year-old, he said, could you at least wait until I retire? And now in my senior year, I'm completing my honors thesis in political communication, developing my own research questions, and designing my own experiment, experiment while serving as the undergraduate student body president and preparing myself for the next step in life. So if you know anyone hiring, I am definitely looking. But in all seriousness, my experience was the perfect trifecta. I, had supported I have supportive faculty that have challenged me and supported me curriculum that has structured all of my extracurricular opportunities and on-campus leadership experiences that have allowed me to grow and develop as a member of our campus community and as an engaged citizen in increasingly globalized democracy. The university has opened my mind to new possibilities. It's helped create a path, it's helped me create a path for myself that has allowed me to create transferable skills and transferable and flexible skills that are malleable to whatever I want to do, rather than skills that confine me to one sector, industry, or job. To me, focusing on undergraduate readiness means helping students navigate their coursework, giving them language to talk about their skills in a, in a way that makes sense to potential employers, and helping every CLA student prepare, prepare for whatever comes next. I believe the college and everyone involved in the work that it does has a moral responsibility to prepare students for meaningful lives after graduation. With just a few months to go before I walk across the stage at Mariucci and receive my diploma, I feel confident the college has given me the knowledge and tools I need to thrive. Thank you for, being, thank you for the part you've played in keeping CLA strong and ensuring all of our futures, mine included, are bright. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Professor Mark Snyder, who will talk about the importance of research in the College of Liberal Arts, as well as his own work on the psychology of volunteerism. Professor Snyder joined the faculty at the University of Minnesota in 1972 after receiving his PhD in psychology from Stanford University. He is currently a McKnight Presidential Chair in Psychology, as well as the Director of the Center for the Study of the Individual and Society here at the university. Professor Snyder is the recipient of the CLA's Dean's Medal and also serves as chair of the research global team for the CLA Roadmap. When Professor Snyder is not researching how individuals create their own social worlds, you can find him with his graduate students in classes such as personality and social behavior and the self. We are honored to have Professor Snyder speaking here this morning and please join me in giving him a warm welcome to the stage. It is really both a pleasure and an honor to be with you uh, today. Um, approximately a year ago, Dean Coleman invited me to chair the research goal team of the roadmap strategic planning process, and it was with a certain amount of trepidation that I said yes, because although I had a very strong identity as a researcher, I wasn't totally sure that I really understood everything about research going on in the college. and. 
Well, however much I knew going in, I certainly knew a lot more coming out of it because it has been a fantastic experience to have worked very closely with a select group of 20-some members of the CLA community, faculty, graduate students, undergraduate staff, all brought together to discuss the state of research in the college, ideas for optimizing it, ideas for moving into the future. Um, among the clearest lessons uh, that the roadmap process and our now process of moving forward is the very graphic reminder that when it comes to research, the College of Liberal Arts is a really a vibrant community of individuals with a shared concern with research, whether it's faculty researchers, postdoctoral scholar researchers, graduate students, undergraduates, the staff who are deeply involved in making the research mission of the college move forward. We are, you know, a great community of researchers, and we're a community that mirrors the great diversity of intellectual traditions that the College of Liberal Arts has. You know, we have excellence in research in the social sciences. We have the humanities with its excellent intellectual traditions. We have the arts, all part of a college. And it's not that these are three separate entities within the college. These are distinct intellectual uh, traditions that have their own defining features, but also have their common features that all of the intellectual traditions of the college are united in a shared love of the challenge of doing research, engaging in creative activity, answering important questions, gaining new understanding, uh, creating something new, whether it's new knowledge, new theory, new basis of application, new artistic expression, whether it is understanding what is the fundamental quality of human nature, the essence of what makes us humans, whether it's understanding how individuals connect with the larger society, whether it's to make a difference through getting involved in the political process or their communities, or whether it's to contribute to society by creating new work um, of art and creative expression. These are all things that fall within the scope of the research mission of the college. Um, not all research is, uh, is identical. Um, uh, some research and some creative expression revolves around knowledge and creative activity for the sake of, of new understanding. Um, other research activity is very much directed at addressing practical problems to understand how it is that we can improve, you know, peace and well-being and a well-functioning uh, society. Um, other uh, research uh, is, um, you know, de devoted to building bridges between different intellectual traditions, just as some research is very much rooted in a particular individual uh, research uh, tradition. To my mind, research is fundamentally important uh, to the College of Liberal Arts and to the university. And it, you know, if you'll permit me a moment of placing research at the center of the universe, let me tell you why. I see research in some ways as the glue that holds together all that we do within, within the college. We often think of the missions of the college of being the missions of teaching, research and service. And it seems to me that research connects all of the missions. Um, research is absolutely essential to teaching. I teach courses in psychology, primarily in the fields of social psychology, how people connect with other individuals, and personality psychology, how people express their own individuality. I would have nothing to teach in my courses were it not for the research that has developed the theories, conducted the uh, studies that are the basis of the courses that I teach. Same across all of the diversity of the college. We have something to teach in our courses, something to use to awaken the curiosity and motivate the next generations of scholars and members of society because of our research. When we think about the service mission of the college, providing service to the university and service to the community, well, so much of that is rooted in research. When it comes to members of the university and being citizens of, the, of their communities, the state, the nation, the world, 
Well, where does the expertise for being a good citizen comes from? Well, it comes from the research that they, you know, have uh, done. And it's that sense in which I think of research, you know, as being the engine that provides the, the movement forward of the College of Liberal Arts through it being a defining base of our teaching, of our service. I also think research is terribly important because it tends to build community within the college. I saw this serving on the goal team for research research for the roadmap process, although we came together coming out of many separate intellectual traditions, as we discovered our shared values for research, our shared ideas about how to improve upon and build uh, the excellence of uh, the research mission and the recommendations that we were able to make to the dean, and which many of which he is implementing, we formed a strong sense of community, of being a community of, uh, of researchers. Uh, and and uh, I gained, and many of us also gained, an, an increased appreciation for the many different disciplinary perspectives that come together in the college and the ways in which bridges between them can contribute to work, uh, research, and scholarship and creative activity across disciplines through multidisciplinary work, interdisciplinary work, and so on, and the great synergy that comes from building bridges among traditions. Um, if I could just say in the two, three minutes remaining a little bit about um, what excites me in my own research. Well, what excites me in my research is the same thing that excites me about why research is so important. I've spent, um, I mean, I've been doing research for almost 40 years uh, now. I started very, very young in nursery school doing research. And I've worked on a variety of problems, some of which are understanding people's identity as individuals and members of society. Some is about how people relate to each other uh, through their interactions with each other, their membership in groups and organizations. And some of it is about how people bond with the societies around them. And in particular, in recent years, so much of our research has been devoted to finding an answer to a question. And the question is, why does anyone ever step outside of the sphere of their own private personal self-interest to do something for the benefit of other people and for the good of society? What makes people move from being focused on themselves to having a more communal attitude toward society and wanting to work for the common good? And we, and when I say we, I mean I'm part of a multidisciplinary research team uh, based in psychology, but drawing in many other social sciences and humanities in the College of Liberal Arts and throughout the university, working together in a small research center called the Center for the Study of the Individual and Society, and we study things like when and why do people make the decision to contribute to charities, to get involved as a volunteer, to join a community group, or maybe take a leadership role in one, to engage in advocacy, working for a cause they care about, to join the political process, and so on. These are all forms of a generic phenomenon we call pro-social action, working for the good of others and for society. It's something that is really prevalent in society. A lot of my own studies are of the phenomenon of volunteering. Year in and year out, some 60 million American adults are engaged as volunteers, contributing about 8 billion hours of uh, service, um, all unpaid labor. If it were paid labor, it would be worth a fortune, as the Bureau of Labor Statistics of the U.S. Department of Labor is constantly uh, telling us we would be looking at almost $200 billion worth of services. But I have to say, when I got involved in this research, one of the reasons I got involved was as important as I thought volunteering and charitable giving and political participation and, and, and such were to society, it also struck me that they're all very, very curious phenomena. And what makes them curious is it's often a lot easier to think of reasons why people would not be a volunteer would not give to charity, would not get involved in their communities. Why? Doing all of these things takes up time, takes time away from other things, can be effortful, uh, can, be, can be difficult, and above all, it as the term volunteering suggests, these are voluntary acts that are not forced upon people. And all things being equal, generally people are less likely to do things that are totally voluntary. And so the question is why? 
Why does anyone ever volunteer? Why does anyone engage in charitable giving? Why does anyone devote their time and effort to uh, a community group, to whether it's a neighborhood block watch, or whether it's to encourage energy conservation, or whether it's to elect a political candidate? And in our research, we have found that this has been a highly generative question for us. We found that there's been tremendous value to us from flipping the way the question had historically been asked. I and my coworkers are not the first people to address the question of why does anyone ever get involved in doing good for others. Uh, there was much work that came before us, lots of theories, lots of research, but all of which had in common that it was focused on looking at the things that volunteers do, the things that people who get involved as activists do. The notion being, if people are helping others, they're being um, good citizens, they are being altruistic, they are being pro-social. In other words, the focus was on if people are doing good works, what kind of good attributes of character do they have that make them do it? And it was a lot of research finding out, are there certain kinds of personalities or values of an altruistic, compassionate, concerned, good citizen variety that lead people to do these things? Well, we very quickly learned that as appealing as that was as an explanation, good people do good things, it was a terribly incomplete explanation. Because as much as it's true that people who volunteer, who get involved in their communities in all kinds of ways, as much as it's true that they have these caring, concerned, compassionate, and altruistic values, but the problem with that explanation is other people in fact, almost everyone who doesn't get involved as a volunteer, who doesn't get involved in their community, who doesn't give to charity, who doesn't do good, they have a lot of the same values. That there's just as many good people not doing good works as there are good people doing good work. So we flipped the question around. You know, rather than focusing on what aspects of people match up with the good works that they're doing, we asked, is it the case that in addition to doing good for other people through volunteering or charitable giving or things like that, there are ways in which people gain things for themselves through their volunteering? In addition to helping others and doing good for society, are they somehow doing good for themselves? And that was the key that opened the lock to understanding the problem of volunteerism. Because it turns out that people who volunteer and in particular, those who sustain their activity over time are people who found a way to bring together the agenda of helping others with doing something for themselves, whether it's that they make friends and meet people through their volunteering, or whether it's that they boost their own self-esteem, or whether it's that they acquire new skills, or they make career contacts that advance their careers. These are all things whereby people are able to gain some benefits for themselves at the same time as they do good for others. They essentially create a win-win situation in which other people people and society are the beneficiaries of their good works, but they advance their own personal agendas by uh, doing so. And that was one of the basic messages that came out of um, our research. It's a message that's allowed us to um, rewrite some of the theories about what is the nature of human nature in the domain of, of concern and helping of others. It has allowed us to write some prescriptions to give advice to organizations and society that are dependent on the volunteer labor of others to help, to, to go out and help them uh, develop recipes for effectively recruiting volunteers, using them in ways in their organizations that will make them satisfied and effective and long-serving volunteers, and in general, you know, improving the cohesion and involvement in society that doing good through, through such things as volunteering, giving, and so on are. Well, that's just my story in research, and I'm just one of many, many, many people in the College of Liberal Arts involved in research and creative activity, and it's now my great pleasure and honor to introduce you to some 15 of my colleagues who will show up on the screen and tell you a little bit about the exciting things in their research and creative activity.
My name is Daniel Griffin. I teach in the Department of Geography, Environment, and Society. I use tree rings to study environmental history and climate change. My latest research shows that California's drought is unusual in the last 1,000 years. I'm Jennifer Marshall. I teach in the Department of Art History. I'm researching William Edmondson, the African-American folk sculptor from the Great Depression. My book, William Edmondson, Life and Work, has been funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. My name is Adam Rothman. I teach statistics at the University of Minnesota. I also develop methods for modeling data with more measured characteristics than subjects. I live, research, and teach in the global Midwest, and I recently co-edited an interdisciplinary collection called Asian Americans in Dixie. I'm Jigna Desai, and I work on race and migration in the United States. I'm Matt Rahayam, and I teach ethnomusicology and North Indian classical music here in the College of Liberal Arts. I just returned from a trip to India on a Fulbright where I was doing research for a book project on vocal techniques and traditions of ethical virtue. I'm Tracy Mann from the Department of Psychology. My book on my research came out this year. It's called Secrets from the Eating Lab, The Science of Weight Loss, The Myth of Willpower, and Why You Should Never Diet Again. My name is Marcus Dilliard, and I teach lighting design for the stage in theater arts and dance. This year, I designed Tartuffe for the Shakespeare Theater in DC. My approach was based on time of day and was very much about the absence of light. I'm Eva Fondasso, professor of the history and languages of the ancient Near East. I study the earliest civilizations we can know about based on their own written records. This year, I won the Rome Prize for my project on freedom and governance. I inquire into how states formed, how they worked, and how they failed based on sources like this clay cone inscribed in cuneiform. I'm Tim Keogh. I've taught economics at the University of Minnesota, and I've done research here at the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis since 1987. This past year, the Guggenheim Foundation awarded me a fellowship to write a book on the economic impact of the North American Free Trade Agreement on the United States, Canada, and Mexico. I'm Erica Lee. I teach American history, and I've just published a book called The Making of Asian America. I also direct the Immigration History Research Center, where we're discovering new ways of understanding immigration in the past and the present. I'm Carol Klee from the Department of Spanish and Portuguese Studies. This past year, the College of Liberal Arts Language Center received a flagship grant from the federal government in order to conduct research on how students' proficiency in a second language develops over time in order to aid them in their pursuit of high levels of language competence. I'm Jeannie O'Brien. I teach in the History Department. This past year, I won the Lifetime Achievement Award in American Indian History from the Western History Association for the books that I've published and for co-founding the Native American and Indigenous Studies Association. I'm Tom Rose, and I teach in the Department of Art. This past year, I've been working with this consortium of schools and departments on how art influences culture and society and how culture and society influences art and artists. This is a grant supported by the Henry Luce Foundation. I'm Elaine Tyler May. I teach in American Studies and History. With support from the National Endowment for the Humanities and the Guggenheim Foundation, I'm completing a book on the American quest for security, both national and personal. I'm sociologist Chris Eugen. My research on felon voting rights has taken me and my students from the courthouse to the White House. We're seeing firsthand how knowledge of crime, law, and punishment helps us build a more just and peaceful world. The video you just saw was a perfect introduction to the final part of our morning, a conversation with Dean Coleman focusing on the progress of CLA's roadmap and its four goals. Joining Dean Coleman is Bua Zhang. Ms. Zhang has been a staff reporter with CARE 11 for the past five years. Previously, she covered city government and education for KBJR in Duluth. Ms. Zhang is also an alumna of the University of Minnesota, having received her bachelor's degree in journalism. Please join me in welcoming Dean Coleman and Bua Zhang to the stage. Hey everyone. Ooh. That's 
that's what, that'll wake you up. Yeah, that'll do it. <laughs> well, like Cheryl said, I am a proud alum, and I really couldn't have done it without some of the teachers that I had here at the CLA who helped me find my first job in television news. I wouldn't have done it, couldn't have done it without them. So it's a pleasure to be here with you this morning, Dean well, Thank Fulman. you for being here. You've been here for a year. How has it been? It's been a great first year. This is an, it's an amazing, as you just saw, this is an amazing college. We're in the middle, middle of this, or middle, maybe we surround <laughs> this amazing university. Uh, but we are part of this amazing university and being here in the Twin Cities gives us so many things that we can do that other universities can't do, and we talk a lot about that uh, at the university level as well as the college level. How do we uh, amplify the effects of being in this, this uh, major market? And that certainly has influenced some of the goals that we've looked at over the course of the first year. I've met so many wonderful uh, alumni and supporters who just love the college and, and want us to do well and love the, uh, love the university. So it's been really exciting for me. I've learned, uh, I've learned a lot. I won't say I'm at the top of the learning curve, but at least <laughs> it's not quite as steep right now as it was, uh, as it was a year ago. And uh, my acronym memory is getting much better. <laughs> uh, I haven't gotten them all down yet, but I'm getting better. Great. And you know, when you, when you uh, this time last year, you laid out the uh, road ahead. Um, and you said that when it comes to liberal arts, we have often been playing a defensive role instead of an offensive role. How's offense doing? Yeah, we, we have made a concerted effort at this over the course of the last, uh, last year. And that involves things that are obviously very public when we're out uh, speaking, but it also involves things like having our websites do a much better job of telling the story of what it is that we, uh, what it is that we do. So we've been working, working a lot on that. And it's also been talking to people on campus and off campus and to prospective students about the value of the liberal arts and what, they, uh, what the liberal arts contribute how it leads to a great life, how it, as we saw in the research, how it contributes to understanding uh, pro uh, problems in society and, and uh, really making for a deeper connection uh, among communities. So I think we, we've done a good job at that. We still have a lot to do, but the, the point is that you won't ever hear me um, feeling defensive or speaking in a defensive way about the liberal arts or being in a position of apologizing for uh, for what we do or how we do it or the kind of things that we, that we study. And I have to say, this is something that appeals to uh, our alumni tremendously. They're really proud of what they accomplished in the college that they, that they went to. And when I've been in events and I've used this, um, sort of used this uh, expression of the fact that we will be advocating and not apologizing, uh, I will say there have been a couple of times where I got impromptu applause and I made a mental note, okay, if rest of speech goes bad, say that line again. Because <laughs> that one seems really to work. Uh, but people were energized by that. They, they've heard a long, you know, years of uh, some, some beating up on the liberal arts maybe, and uh, they don't believe it certainly, and they, they look and see how their lives are. And they're, they're glad that we're taking that leadership role. So I think we've gotten off to a great start uh, with it, and we will be consistent and persistent on that. And as you continue to advocate for uh, the liberal arts, uh, you have some great points in your roadmap. Um, how, how, what are some important ones that you'll be focusing on this year to continue advocating for liberal arts? Well, to, to think about one that we've spent a lot of time on, obviously one of the concerns that parents and students and you know, maybe other, other stakeholders have is, well, what happens at the end? Do you mm -hmm. get your training in the liberal arts, and then where do you go on in terms of a, a career and success and so on. So we've spent a lot of time and uh, devoted a lot of resources this last year to making sure that we are building confidence in our students that they do have a plan, that they do have, they can see a pathway from how they take their, their education in the liberal arts and go out into, uh, into the, the world of careers. So we've added a significant amount of resources to our career advising, We've added uh, internship coordinators so that we can develop uh, internship relationships with organizations in the, uh, in the Twin Cities. We, ha we are developing what we've been referring to as career bundles, and we now have a more uh, formal name of a uh, career, pathway, career, career Pathways Readiness uh, <laughs> Initiative. I might have those in the wrong order, but uh, those are the right, uh, the right words. And the idea here is that we want to, we want to package together for students curricular, outside the classroom experiences like internships, study mm -hmm. abroad, research, and then 
alumni mentors. And we want to package these together in bundles, if you will, so that a student who's interested in high tech, or they're interested in healthcare, or they're interested in public relations, or they're interested in uh, finance, or they're interested in uh, new media, whatever it might be, that we've developed this, these set of career bundles that they can look at and say, I can see the path, how I get from where I am now to launching out into that, uh, out into that career. I think that's an important message for students to hear. It's an important message for their parents to hear who are rightfully concerned about what's going to happen in the next stage after uh, their son or daughter graduates. And it's important for uh, people in the community, legislators and so on, to hear as well that the liberal arts are not, it's not an accidental uh, connection to career paths. It is a deep and vibrant and direct path to rewarding careers and we have to articulate that better. Right, and it sounds like um, movements like that have helped students like Joelle, who has figured out her, her path. Well, I'd like to take a lot of credit for Joelle, but <laughs> she was here a long time before I was. Uh, but she did certainly benefit from the, the many uh, services and talents that were in the uh, college over that time. And as you heard, mm -hmm. uh, being in this environment gave her amazing opportunities with internships and to find her way. Right? The idea here isn't that every student comes in and they know I want to do a career in this so I'll go and look at this course bundle, this career bundle, and that'll tell me where to go. But over a period of time of being here, they'll see those examples, they'll hear from our alumni, and as they start to identify their path, they'll have this set of resources available that they can, they can use. But we fully understand and appreciate that students are spending uh, part of their time. They may come in thinking they want to do X, and. They take a class or two in some other area and say, oh, that actually be, might be my passion mm -hmm. over there. And a college of our breadth and diversity really allows students to, uh, to do that. We want to make sure as they are doing that, looking around, that once they, if, if they lock in on a particular career path, when they do, we want to make sure that they have the guidance that they need. Mm -hmm. And as a grad, I will say that I certainly did have the guidance that I needed to get to where I am. Let's talk about uh, faculty and staff. We heard uh, Professor Steiner talk passionately about research, and he called it the glue that holds the college together. Uh, sometimes research and CLA don't always go together. That, that's not the opinion that, that is of the public very much. But you've made it a priority. Um, what does that look like? You, you said you want to invest more into research. What does that look like for you? Yeah. Let, let me echo what Professor Snyder said. Everything we do in a in a university of this type and a college of this type is built on the research and creative work. That is what makes everything work. That's what recruits students. That's what gives them great experiences in the classroom. That's what helps us communicate out to the, uh, to the community, to our stakeholders, to alumni about what's exciting about what's going on uh, in the college. So it helps with our outreach and our engagement mission uh, as well. So it really does create the foundation that supports uh, everything else that we do. So in thinking about how do you support that, you know, the job, my job, and the job of most people in academic leadership positions is to create environments that help people thrive, that put them in the best position to succeed. And sometimes that can mean you know, structural arrangements of, of sort of more administrative things. Sometimes it can mean what kind of resources are available. So to give one example, we know that at a critical, a critical time in a faculty member's career is when they've just become tenured and they're an early associate professor. Critical for two reasons. One, they've maybe gotten some new, well, we hope they've gotten some new research projects that underway while they were an assistant professor. And these are at a point now of needing an additional boost to really launch and to, to, to get to work and, and to elevate those and to accelerate them. At the same time, we also know competitively as a, as a college that this is also a time when people start looking at our associate professors because they've just established that they are tenure worthy and they're great scholars. And so we know that people have their eye on them. So we, uh, through the uh, support of a donor, created a new fund this year that's specifically targeted to associate professors in their first four years after receiving tenure. And it provides them research grants of up to uh, $50,000. So we have a million and a half dollars dedicated to that over the, next, uh, over the next several years. And I think what's important about that, both it's important both for what it does, but I think it will also signal to other potential supporters that we are trying to be very strategic and find places where we can get the maximum impact for using additional resources. And this is an area 
this area of this time in a faculty member's life where it's a little unusual because you come in and you typically have some research support when you are first uh, hired. By the time you get tenured, that is a distant memory and that's been <laughs> long gone and, and, and spent. And you haven't quite gotten to the point later in the, your career where you're starting, starting to win Lifetime Achievement Awards. Mm -hmm. And so you're at this point in the middle. And we saw that that was going to be a critical time to, to help people. I think that kind, of, uh, that kind of message resonates well with uh, donors of, uh, of the college who want to get a sense that you're identifying specific problems and trying to identify specific solutions. So we've been looking into that kind of, uh, uh, that kind of approach just to give one example of how you support research. In, in, in addition to investing in research, you are also investing in uh -huh. diversity. Tell, tell me about that. What does that look like for you? Yeah, so we, we think of diversity in uh, well, multiple respects, but there's certainly two parts of this that are critical. One is uh, recruiting a diverse faculty, staff, and a student body. And so that will mean things like scholarship support and fellowship support. We increased our fellowship support for graduate student recruitment for uh, underrepresented students. Uh, we launched a, a faculty cluster hire that has a diversity and race and ethnicity uh, thematic around it, which uh, we believe will uh, result in four really uh, interesting scholars. I know we got over 370 applications for wow. the four positions. Uh, so we're very excited about that. That's in the stage now of trying to decide who to invite to, uh, to campus. Uh, so we've done that. We, we also have to think about how do you keep people once they're here. Mm -hmm. So it's not just a matter of recruitment, it's a matter of retention. And that really is an issue of creating, doing things to create a welcoming environment, an inclusive environment, one that, one that uh, feels supportive. Uh, part of that is simply getting people connected together early in their time here so that they have a sense of a community on the campus mm -hmm. and in the, uh, in the college. So we'll be doing some work on that this, uh, this coming year and into, into next year as well. Uh, so it involves all of those, you know, it's a, it's a multi-part uh, strategy that we have to consider, but it's absolutely essential that we not only focus on how do we bring people here, but how do we keep them here once they've arrived. And, and well, how do, how do, what, what are your plans to keep them here? When they get here, how do you retain them? How do you make sure that they are successful? Well, I, I think the single most important thing we, we, we believe we know is that um, people can come, they'll be here, and maybe the sense of community and involvement and engagement in the college or in the wider uh, university never quite rises to that level of feeling fully supported. And it's not necessarily that it's, it's antagonism or that it's uh, neglect or hostility, but just a sense of uh, when you are a, uh, a smaller percentage of a larger group, you need to have moments and times that you really can pull together and, and uh, sort of communicate with other folks and get, get together with other folks who are sharing similar circumstances uh, and, and, and experiences. So, and it can be any number of things that we think of, you know, having a welcoming reception for everybody when, when they arrive mm -hmm. uh, so that they get to know each other and they get to know uh, other faculty and staff who are, uh, who are here. We're thinking about similar things on the graduate student side, for example, Rather than only focusing on department by department recruitment, having events that cover multiple departments. So you bring prospective students in and they see there will be a community of people here that I can, uh, that I can engage with and that can be supportive uh, when I'm uh, having, having difficult moments. So that community building aspect will be, uh, I think will be the most important part of this. Well, in addition to uh, building the, connecting the student community here, you've also uh, made it a priority to connect with the greater community. You wanted a more friendly uh, welcome door, if you will, um, front door rather. What, what's that looking like now? Yeah, that's, it's a funny thing. I was using that expression uh, prior to my time getting to campus and since then saying that I wanted to make sure that CLA presented itself as the friendly front door to the university. We're a big, enormous place. It's hard enough for those of us inside to figure it out, <laughs> let alone people coming from the outside who want to try to figure out where do I go right. to get a question answered. And over the course of last year, I'd be sitting in, in meetings, and I don't want to take credit for this because I, I don't really know. But as I'm going through all these meetings, I started hearing all of these references to, we're, we're creating a friendly front door to the university. And by the end of the year, I was thinking, geez, if you have 30 or 40 friendly front doors, that, that's kind of confusing <laughs> itself, isn't it? 
but nonetheless, we do want to be a friendly front door. And that means, um, uh, it means several things. I think one is just uh, communicating to people what it is that we do. I think that's part of it, so website and the visibility. We have a, a, uh, Amelius White, our director of public engagement, who is specifically a point person for external communication mm -hmm. regarding you know, research connections and other kinds of connections. So uh, Amelius and I have been meeting with uh, community leaders to try to talk about how CLA and these organizations can potentially partner. But that office gives people a direct contact point into the college and then we can you know, move people where, uh, where we might want to. So I think even a simplification like that where there's a clear place to go um, is a great start in that, in, in that kind of creation of a friendly, friendly front door. It doesn't mean we answer all the questions in CLA administration, but at least we can point people out into the right direction with, without somebody having to try to call five or 10 different offices to get an answer. Kind of, it's a better access and better, better, exactly. better ways to, to get right. there. Uh, we have about five minutes left. Um, I want to quickly get your thoughts on this. You know, we, there's often a lot of talk about the value of college these days. Is a college you're really valuable? Is, how valuable is a CLA education? Yeah, well, obviously I'm a little biased in answering, <laughs> this, uh, answering this question. But as I, as I you know, think of the challenges that we hear sometimes and some of the, some of the skepticism, I guess what I would tell, what I would suggest that we be we, we say to people is, first of all, look at the track record. Mm -hmm. Look at the amazing range of careers, the amazing range of careers that our students have gone off into, and the incredible accomplishments that they have. Now that's on us to communicate that story well, and so we're working, we're working on that. But we know because we can see the data that our alums go off into unbelievable variety of of uh, career paths and uh, life choices and that they are amazingly, uh, amazingly successful. So I'm, I, I like data, so I would say we, should, we need to point to the data and show what it is that, uh, what are those that our uh, talented alumni do. The other thing I would say is to listen to leaders in organizations, in business, industry, nonprofits, mm -hmm. and so on. Despite, uh, there's a bit of a disjuncture in the public discourse on there. You get some skepticism about the liberal arts from some quarters. But then if you actually talk to business leaders or you talk to organization leaders, talk to nonprofit leaders, they are gung-ho about what the liberal arts do. They know that the liberal arts creates this kind of entrepreneurial, inquisitive, questioning, analytical mindset. They know that the liberal arts focus on communication skills. They know that the liberal arts talk about how do we think about the future, but also how do we understand the past and the context that we're in. They know that the liberal arts are multicultural in their very uh, nature, such as understanding things from different perspectives. And when we talk with uh, business leaders, that's what they want. They say that's, uh, and obviously when we talk with our own alums who are business leaders, they say that's why I've been successful. You know, it isn't the technical training that I got maybe later about how to do some specific uh, technical work on finance or whatever it might be. It's this, this way of understanding. It's this way of analyzing. It's this way of thinking about mm -hmm. the world. That's what's been successful. And those voices, I don't think, um, we probably haven't promoted those voices enough and talked about them enough. And I don't know that they've been enough of the public uh, discourse. So there's been a little bit more of the skeptical voices as opposed to when you go talk with business leaders, Fortune 500 CEOs, uh, and, and people in startups and all over, and they'll say, these are the kind of folks that we want. And we've seen signs of this, the success of better messaging on this. So this year, we just recently had an internship fair. We had uh, over 60 organizations participate, which is far more than we ever had before. We had 1,000 a, a students participate wow. uh, in that as well, which the previous high we'd had was around 600. So I think the message is getting out, and we also have to communicate that to our students as well so that they know you know, people actually want you. Now your job is to articulate to them <laughs> what it is that you know and the skills that you have. So what I'm hearing is we need CLA. Well, that goes without saying. But <laughs> please, keep saying it. Yes. <laughs> we do have uh, some questions that were submitted by staff that I want to get to. Yep. Uh, the first one we have asks, uh, the roadmap discusses student and faculty success. What are the plans for supporting staff? Can you specifically give an update on the multi-year contracts? 
Yes, yeah, so uh, w with regard to the uh, multi-year contract, so this is for p and uh, p and staff, and this is something that's been a real interest of p and staff for years. Uh, we had um, a lot of discussion about this last year. We recently had, a, so we've, we have a policy now for multi-year uh, multi appointments. We had recently a comment period. I believe that's now, uh, has now passed, or if it hasn't, we're at the very tail end of that. So we will be implementing that sometime uh, over the course of this uh, over the course of this year. So it's gone through all of the governance work of various uh, various bodies. The P&A board was instrumental in pushing this forward. So that will be uh, will be happening, and I'm really excited about that. I think it's mm -hmm. absolutely um, absolutely critical, and just as the right respectful thing uh, to do. Other kinds of things we've been doing are well events like this, where we really do invite the staff to be part of. Uh, what's going on in CLA. We will be developing some roadmap groups uh, coming up over the next few months, and those will be uh, have heavy staff involvement as we're trying to build more of a staff community uh, across, the, uh, across the college. I've been uh, thinking about ways that we can better recognize uh, staff for their contributions and so on. So to me, uh, the staff are really what help all of these, these uh, areas that we've talked about research, teaching, outreach, service, engagement, and so on. Staff really makes all that happen and will we'll help faculty to get their work done, obviously help students to get their, uh, their work done as well. So I want, fa I want staff to feel that they're included as part of the roadmap uh, process and as part of the strategic planning in the college. So we will be rolling out some ideas about that where you can be involved or not involved. There's no, uh, no obligation on that part, but we want, do want to make it available for people who want to be engaged to really have that opportunity and feeling like they're helping shape the direction of the college. Mm -hmm. A second question asks, the roadmap seems like an ambitious plan. How will it be funded? Well, it's a combination of, of things. We, uh, we have to make decisions about areas, um, uh, things that we may be uh, doing where we decide that we're going to reallocate resources from, uh, from one area to another. And that's an ongoing job of any organization, really, every year is to make those choices. Mm -hmm. So part of it will come it will come that way. Uh, part of it will come from making our case to the university about the importance of the things that are going on in, uh, in CLA. Uh, part of it will come from, uh, you know, by building more confidence in students about liberal arts education. Uh, I, th I think we would hope that we'll see more enrollments in liberal arts courses mm -hmm. and so on, and that obviously is beneficial to uh, to, the, to the college. And lastly, we will be uh, asking our supporters and our, our donors and potential donors to, to help us to do the kinds of things that uh, don't just keep the trains running, but really give us an extra level of excellence that, um, that sets us apart from other colleges of, of liberal arts. I was just at a meeting in Chicago with other liberal arts deans, and um, you know, every, every school has their their strengths and has their challenges and whatever, but I've come away from every one of those meetings that I've had really energized about what this college has and, and what we can do. And I think we can make the case to our alumni and potential supporters that there's a lot here to, to build on and mm -hmm. a lot to in, in invest in that will really be, uh, can be quite successful. So I'm really confident that that will be a major part of this as well. But, it's those sources all coming together will be how we'll get this done. Mm -hmm. yeah, and a good follow-up question uh, from a staffer says, uh, in addition to doing my job, what else can I do to assist with the roadmap? Well, I think there's a number of things that uh, I think it's good for staff to do as, as we talk about this positive messaging about the liberal arts that isn't just on me and it's not just on uh, department chairs or mm -hmm. faculty, it's everybody, right? We, we all want to be saying what we see. What do we see that's, if one of these stories that you saw in terms of the faculty research or whatever, you know, I mean, just sharing stories about some interesting thing you heard that's going on at the university in the College of Liberal Arts, could you please always mention in the College of Liberal <laughs> Arts? That's, an, that's the important part. Um, that would be good for people to, uh, to do. But then more broadly, as I mentioned a moment, moment ago, we'll have these roadmap uh, teams as we're building the staff community, and that'll be a very practical, hands-on way of being, being involved in the roadmap development going forward. Mm -hmm. And we're always looking for story ideas, so if you guys have any great studies, send them, send them to Carol Absolutely, yes, well. please.
Um, no, this, this, I, I like this question. What's the status of Pillsbury Hall and is it definitely going to happen? The status of Pillsbury Hall, so we had a, uh, so it is, has been approved by the Board of Regents to uh, one of uh, six university projects to proceed to the state legislature. Uh, we are actually having a tour of the building tomorrow with a small group from the legislature, so we'll give them a sense of why we think this is a vital project for the college and for the university. Um, we will then be putting on our best uh, persuasive uh, efforts to uh, convince the legislature that this is one of the projects to fund. They have a lot of competing, you know, very worthy product, uh, projects, no doubt, but we'll want to make the case for why this one is, uh, is deserving of their funding in this particular cycle. So, uh, you know, the, the positive story is we are, you know, we've, we've gone past, gotten over every hurdle we've had to get past uh, up to this point. And um, you just have to keep pressing ahead. But uh, it's in the mix, and it is one that's being considered, will be considered by the, by the legislature. So I think we all feel pretty good about that. It's gotten much further along than it ever has before. And you know, we have great plans for the, for the building. And I think, you know, I, I think when we had the uh, management and budget folks out, they, they responded well to the message that we had about how we would use that building. Great, because that's been in the works since, gosh, that's, that's my been time a, here. <laughs> yes, that's been a 20-year 20 20 yeah. project, so, yeah. yes. The liberal arts teaches persistence. Did I mention, <laughs> I mentioned that was one of our skill sets? Yes. We're masters at that by yes. now, right? How, do you have time for one, one more question? Okay. Um, here's, here's a good one. We've been meeting, you've been meeting with departments across the college. What are you hearing? Are there any common themes? That you're hearing? Yeah, you know, uh, a lot of them, the things that we've t talked about today, I hear a lot about uh, graduate funding. That is something that uh, I, mm -hmm. I didn't mention when we were talking about research excellence, but attracting faculty attracts great graduate students, and attracting great graduate students attracts great faculty. That one really does, does reinforce itself. So we have to do uh, a better job at uh, providing competitive packages to recruit grad students. We will have some positive news to report on that. Um, uh, Hopefully this, uh, this fall we'll be able to announce it, so it can be part of the next recruiting cycle. It won't get us all the way that we need to get, but it'll be an improvement over where we are, uh, where we are now. So we're trying to address that concern. That's been raised in several of these meetings. Uh, the status of the liberal arts has actually come up in several of the meetings as well. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, uh, what are we hearing? Is, is there support at the university? Is there support in the, the Board of Regents? Is there support in the community and so on for the liberal arts? So I think there's, uh, there's some um, uh, worry about that, just given the national dialogue. So I've uh, uh, responded to uh, responded to that quite a uh, in a quite a number of the meetings. So those are two things that pop up, and there's been a fair amount of discussion as well about um, the career readiness uh, program and how do we balance that with what we want our students to do in the more sort of intellectual sense of the the liberal arts. And I always explain that I don't see these as competing competing goals. It isn't that we have to dramatically change what we're teaching. It's really how do we help students know what they know right. so that they can convey that when they go out and interview, uh, interview for jobs. It isn't saying that we will uh, sort of dramatically change what's, what's in the course. And the example that I usually give of this, because it is my own experience, is uh, some simple things can, uh, can help. Well, when I was at this meeting of Big Ten deans, one of the deans said, you know, we found out that enrollments went up in one of our courses when we called it to hell and back rather than Dante. <laughs> so, you know, some, some of it is how you, how you frame, uh, frame things, but it, it is giving students great information about the courses mm -hmm. that they're going to, going to take. And I've told a story about uh, many years ago looking at, really for the first time in quite a while, looking at the descriptions of the courses that I was teaching because you say that's off on a student website and they register for courses. And... I didn't think they were very good. You know, they had been written probably a long time ago to fit in a little catal printed catalog where you could only fit 30 or 40 words <laughs> in there. And they didn't, I didn't think, express very well what students would be learning in the course and why they should take that class and, uh, and so on. So in talking with faculty, it isn't so much a question of you need to teach different stuff in your class, but we need to do a better job of explaining what a student will get if mm -hmm. they take that class. So it doesn't have to be seen as a competition between helping students be confident about career direction and 
helping stu students grow in their intellectual life. I think these are really complementary. Right. Well, it sounds like you are on a great road, and, and uh, good luck for, we'll do this again next year. How about that? That sounds, that sounds excellent. Thanks for being a great example of a highly successful CLA <laughs> alum. We appreciate that. And I want to thank all of the, um, uh, all of the staff for your contributions over the course of the, uh, the last year. Uh, I think you, know, you have been engaged in the roadmap process. You've been engaged in the work in your departments and units, and it's been it's just, uh, as I said before, it is really what gets things, uh, gets things done. I do want to remind people that every month I have uh, open office hour where I've had staff, uh, uh, and that is dedicated to staff, so where staff have come in and just shared if you have a concern, if you have, it can be good news, bad news, doesn't really matter, and just let me know what's, uh, what's on your mind. And that's very helpful for me because I hear you know, I just hear things that way that uh, I, I wouldn't be aware, and it gets them on my radar, and I can follow up, uh, follow up on them. So I would invite you, that's every month, I would invite you to take advantage of that if you haven't. And if you have, you're more than welcome to come back as a repeat customer. So uh, please do. Great. Thank you very All much. Right. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you to Dean Coleman, Bua Zhang, and Professor Snyder for joining us this morning to discuss the CLA roadmap. I would like to invite all of you to reception where you can speak more with Dean Coleman and our other speakers. Please join me outside for, of the theater for coffee and pastries and fruit. Thank you all for attending and have a great rest of your day.